Foi ele, foi ele. My colleagues, by the way, just in case you, yeah, <laughs> we're laughing at the big faces at the back. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> hey, sorry. Sorry, Joe. Yeah, I think okay. so. So over to you, Fiona, who's the digital lead for literacies in the Centre for Innovation and Technologies and Education at the University of Southampton. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, the um, centre I've worked for has just changed, <laughs> as, as I want. Um, we're so innovative, we've changed already. So we are now in the Institute for um, in Learning, Innovation and Development, and it spells Iliad, which is quite trendy. So we, we really like that. Um, so yes, my talk today, I've been asked, I'm the chair of the um, Alt MOOC SIG, and it's been a blast, I have to tell you, it's been great. We've been launched a year now, so it was a good opportunity for me to come in to you today and talk to you about what we've been up to, um, what we've seen over the last year, and where we think we're going to go. So um, yeah, this is my little presentation for you all. So what have we been talking about? So we watch MOOCs for Alt. That's our little strap line that we came up with. Um, so my involvement came about because I answered the call. They were looking for developing a SIG on MOOCs. And I happened to have been just looking at my theme for my master's. I was doing a master's with Edinburgh. And I went to Hugh Davis, who is my um, boss in the center. And I said, um, what should I do my dissertation on? What do you think? And he said, do it on MOOCs. He wouldn't tell me why, so I thought, OK. Um, so I said, well, he wasn't allowed to say at that time, but we were just about to join FutureLearn. So when the call came out, I'd already started looking at MOOCs, already started gathering information, and there was so much at that time. So being part of this was a huge opportunity for me to get, really get involved across the country using Alt's fantastic network um, so we could explore what actually was happening. So along with the research I was doing, this tied in really, really nicely. So that's my little bit of background. So who are we? Who are we? Here we are. Um, yes, I'm the chair. There's um, Mira and James who are here and Tracy up there too. Uh, the only one that isn't here today is David, but hopefully he is watching us from the remote shores of Australia because that's where he's from. Um, but we've basically been, for about the last year, we've been communicating through virtual means because we're all scattered at different places. Um, and we've enabled that, obviously, by um, using the, um, the Google Hangouts. So our meetings were mainly online, um, and we've met more or less once a month for the whole year, I'd say. So far, our impact, we have, we've done a few things. So we've got, some, we've got 114 members. Um, we've got some good amount of followers on Twitter, and we've had two conferences. So, um, and we also have the website, which is a blog, uh, which I'll talk about later on. Um, we've been using the hashtag AltMOOCSIG, which is what we've been doing to generate in interest in um, our activities. I was just going to tell you a little bit about the conferences um, that we've been doing, because we've had a really, they've been really, really good. Oops, there we are. So, um, yeah, the first conference was in November. So we launched in September 2013. In November, we had our first conference at the University of Southampton. Um, and so that was all about um, looking at where we're going, looking at what's happening at the time. And it, was, it was about 50 people that came along, which is a nice number. Um, we had presentations from Amy Woodgate in um, Edinburgh. Uh, we had FutureLearn. FutureLearn had just launched at that time, so they'd been around a couple of months at that point. And um, Simon Nelson came down and spoke um, for us. We also did, um, we had a couple of um, keynotes that were um, really, really good. One was um, uh, Jonathan Worth, which was the um, Phonar MOOC, the photography MOOC. And also, um, we had a guy from um, Vanderbilt University who, through the magic of um, Google Hangouts and Martin Hawksey, um, was able to communicate with us for that, for that keynote. Um, looking at the themes at the time, it was really more about some, these, these are the series of themes that we think we came up with. So there was a lot, a lot about what impact MOOCs would have on institutions, uh, what the role for institutions was. Our vice chancellor spoke about um, the reasons that we were engaging with FutureLearn. So that was 
good for us to hear about. That was nice. Um, also, there was a lot about the data. So Martin did the talk about analytics, so we could look at the kind of data that's being generated. I think Katie Jordan at this time was producing lots of information from the Open University about the activities around um, the MOOC learners and Coursera and other platforms. Um, and also we had a look at CMOOC. So it wasn't just, and we've done this on purpose, we don't deliberately look at just FutureLearn or just MOOCs that are on um, X MOOCs, if you like. Uh, we're looking at the range of open access um, opportunities for um, learning. So some of the um, outputs from that Southampton conference is Amy. Um, there's Simon Nelson and Hugh Davis having a chat there. We had um, live streams. Uh, we even had a guy who came in with his iPad and was doing sketch notes, kind of like you, Brian, but not as cool. And um, he was just drawing out um, stuff for us. So that was really nice to have. And um, yeah, it's a, a really nice buzz to it. And I think, I think we have to say overall, generally, that the um, activities that we've done face-to-face have been really, really marvellous, and we've got a really nice community of um, MOOC spurts, I had to say it, um, that come along. Uh, the other conference was the most recent one. This one happened in June at UCL. Mira mainly is responsible for this, I would say. We talked to her online, and she just went away and did stuff. Um, and it became um, a two-tiered conference in a way. So 90 people came along to that conference, um, a range of different speakers. Um, again, we had um, a set of themes. Still data. Data's been a consistent thing, I think, for us. Um, uh, but there was more about change, about the pedagogy of MOOCs. Um, what MOOCs can do. So before we were looking what impact MOOCs could have, and that was the potential of MOOCs. Um, and also about expectations. And that was a, a really nice uh, workshop that we did um, that was really interesting with people talking about what he had promised would happen for MOOCs and what's actually happened and what kind of things we said. That was really interesting. Uh, again, some of the um, outputs from that, there was a, a whole section on the benefits of a MOOC. Um, and there was also um, lots and lots of really nice feedback, and there was a real buzz. This time, I think as the time went on, more people were settling down, the hype was dying down a little bit, and we were able to really engage with really, well, we've done some MOOCs now, what do we think? Because a lot right at the beginning was we know about MOOCs, and we've looked at some and we've started a few, but now we had um, other things happening. So let's have a little look about uh, I think yeah looking back over the year so now um, there's been over 43 UK MOOCs um, happening so this is a, obviously a result of future learn um, but there's also plenty of MOOCs that are happening that aren't on platforms they're using various tools like um, Udemy or iversity things that are not specific to us and I believe there's a talk uh, the guy using Pebblepad to do a MOOC, which I think is quite interesting. So these things will develop. Um, there's an excellent timeline that um, Sean Bain has produced in Edinburgh, and um, it's part of their report on the HE, uh, from the HEA about the MOOCs, where we are. Um, lots and lots of useful information in that, but she's done a really nice timeline, so you can see where the MOOCs were. So this doesn't cover repeats of MOOCs. There's lots of people repeat MOOCs. So what else happened? Ah, the biz reports. So just as we were launching the SIG, the um, biz report, the business skills report about MOOCs, where we are, essentially a literature review about what has been happening, not just in the UK, but also in America, um, Canada, and other countries. Um, it came out with three recommendations. This is what they said in 2013. So we should be pushing forward with accreditation. So let's get some um, credentialing, as they call it. Um, encourage innovation and transformation of CPD and using MOOCs as a vehicle. So an online skill. So I still, my lead of being a digital literacy person, um, that's my particular interest. And one of the things I thought would happen with MOOCs would be that academics would see themselves online and want to manage their online identity, would want to be able to engage with people um, at a distance. And they'd also be able to do that effectively because they would be trying to set up some kind of model of skills development for the learners, because they're not students, they're learners when they're on a MOOC. Um, has that happened? Not really sure. Some of it, a little bit, maybe. Who knows? So the other thing that happened, September, everything was happening in September. Launch of us, launch of the Biz Report, and then FutureLearn came along. Big bang, 20,000 students in the first 24 hours. 
um, a range of institutions. There's much more than there were. So there were 22 at the time, or 20. Um, it's gone up, it's a lot higher now. And they're not all in the UK, they're Australian, um, and, and other, in, not just institutions, British Library, um, British Council are all involved. So that made quite a big impact, I think, on the uh, landscape for British MOOCs because um, FutureLearn was the provider that our institutions had signed up for. So that was quite interesting. One of the great things that we went to in November was the London Knowledge Lab event, which is about MOOCs, what the research says. Absolutely fascinating. It was really, really good. Um, members of our SIG went along. Lots of us, well, lots were in London anyway. Um, but it was particularly good because we could get to speak to people about their interests. And some were already old members, but some weren't. And there was a range of different speakers to go there. And that was really, really valuable. And we really, really liked that one. So that happened. Okay, and one other thing, um, in March this year, uh, the QAA put a statement out on MOOCs, um, should they be interested in MOOCs. MOOCs are, uh, rep well, the UK MOOCs are representative of the UK higher education, so the question really is, should M the QAA um, have a position on what's being generated in the name of UK higher education? Uh, I went to a FutureLearn Partners meeting um, with the QAA, and that was really interesting because um, Stephen Jackson from the QAA had a few questions for us, and of, he was asking about MOOCs generally. But we, we did point out that it's not just FutureLearn, but um, they've actually come to the conclusion they shouldn't be involved in the MOOCs, but they'll make, um, they're actually going to make a MOOC themselves where they're going to explain about the quality assurance processes and it's there as guidance. That's really useful and really positive. It was nice for them to come and have a chat with us. MOOCs are evolving. So um, what we've realised over the year is that MOOCs have, we very much at the beginning where it's all about X MOOCs and C MOOCs. So you're either one camp or you're another. And, and never the twain shall meet, but they've actually beginning to develop now. So as we are looking at what an X MOOC is and what a C MOOC is, people are coming to the conclusion now that actually bringing the two together, there are elements from each that are quite useful and can be developed. And as you can see already, um, institutions and organizations are developing their own groupings of these. So we have Sparks and Books and Docs and Boops, lovely. What do they all mean? Well, we've got um, short private open courses, um, big or boutique open online courses, uh, distributed open creative courses, and oh, I can't remember the last one. But the point is that people are not just, they're looking at the model, they're looking at the technology, and they're looking to see what they can do with it, and they're having an idea that they can actually go ahead and create something, which is a good thing. It's all good for creativity and innovation, I would say. So, but we're watching, always watching. So, yes, the role of the teacher and the MOOC is something that has emerged as a theme. Um, what is a teacher on a MOOC? Are you a teacher on a MOOC? Um, originally, we had the rock star MOOC, so we had people like Michael Sandel and the celebrities. Um, those kind of people are distant because they never actually respond to an inquiry or a query in a MOOC platform, but they're there because they are the ones that have the content knowledge. Um, there are people that are academics on MOOCs and they are involved in terms of facilitating and actually take part in the MOOC. So there are different kinds. But there's also the automated, the automation of the teacher. So are they teaching? Is there any teaching happening? No, they're probably not teaching anything. They're just there facilitating in an automatic way. Um, and those are things normally on things like machine learning and Python, the things that you wouldn't really need to have any kind of human interaction, but you can do a multiple choice question and the answers are already given to you. Recently, that, that was one of the reasons that they did it, because they didn't even need to, but they did because they wanted their reputation to be reinforced and to always be on their high game, always, always, always. So this is actually a question. And it, uh, so what does the future hold? So, having looked at, um, I looked at the study that uh, came out from the HEA, and I also keep a, um, a scoop it. I don't know if many of you know what scoop it is. It's basically a curation tool, and I keep and um, we share with the Alt MOOC SIG a um, list of everything that's well, not a list websites, a visual representation where I've noted down 
um, my thoughts about each of the um, the latest research or the latest commentary about MOOCs. And these were the things that came out, pick out from me. Um, learning an analytics, that's still a very key and very important part and picture of the MOOC landscape. Um, learning from the analytics means we know, know how students should be able to learn online. Most higher education institutions are doing something online and it will increase. So we should learn from this, the massive research project we call the MOOCs. Um, learn how people are learning online and then we can apply what we can learn about see what people fall down what they like what they don't like we can apply that to our on-campus students and that's one of the things that's my particular interest is uh, the MOOCs that we are developing now can be used for our on-campus students what do we get from that professional development um, when Diana came to our conference in um, June she spoke about CPD and MOOCs and um, Miranda Nett were doing a MOOC on for, with primary school teachers um, that's one example of how CPD are engaging the kind of roles that, that the MOOCs can have with um, people that do MOOCs um, already have a, a degree or higher and lots of people are doing MOOCs just to um, enhance the skills they have just to keep up to date and that's great that's fine but we could very expensive professional development courses could um, take some lessons from that and apply that to um, the MOOC landscape and um, uh, benefit from it. Um, Udacity have stopped most of their free courses it's $150 now to do some of their courses and um, the idea is that they a little bit and you get a lot from it and uh, we can't go on giving away free courses forever. Um, I think that there will be more online courses. The um, effect that the on engagement and um, as a result of that, they're more interested in doing things online where they, they really wouldn't have had the time to do before. Um, so um, we see um, MOOCs as a Trojan horse for getting people interested, taking those early adopters and putting them to be um, further along the chasm, as you like, jumping over the chasm onto the higher um, spectrum. I didn't really want it. They asked me to say, what do you think is going to happen? I'm oh, nah. We can't do that. We don't know what's going to happen. And I saw this quote just the other day from Gregor Ken Kennedy. Um, he was talking about how MOOCs have opened up the can of worms for engaging in much more innovation which is a good thing it is a good thing but he's right only the brave will make solid predictions about where where MOOCs will be and I'm not that brave so I'm not going to do that um, but it's just giving you some ideas um, in terms of um, what we'll be doing with the SIG um, we really want to know what you think we want to know what your experiences are we want to know what you've been involved in and where you think MOOCs should be and where they're going reading about courses being replaced solely by online courses and we've been reading about professor-led professor-less universities um, I read an article just the other day that said that MOOCs have started interest with um, administrators in replacing the professors I don't think that's going to happen um, I think that um, institutions have a place for everything, but I want to know what you think. We're really, really interested. Um, your interests, and um, it can just be commentary. It doesn't have to be full-on research, but we really want to get the um, community going. One thing I can say is that our community has really, really developed. Um, we really have a, a buzz for everything we're doing. We, um, our conference, I think our conferences are our key highlights, but all through the year we want to keep that momentum going. Um, and I think that's probably more or less it. We have our meeting today at 5.45 in room 0 0.11, wherever that is. We haven't found that yet. Um, and you're all very welcome to come along and um, we'll work out. I wonder if um, actually you would agree. The first is that platforms and MOOC providers stop actually banging on about uh, the number of people that have signed, signed up, up for a MOOC in the first place if they're saying it's completely irrelevant in terms of success. And uh, secondly, that we actually design MOOCs in such a way that you can actually just drop in mm -hmm. for one bit, uh, perhaps not by having to sign up at the start and ins instead actually releasing the uh, resources openly. Um, 
I think that we need to get uh, beyond uh, the idea that it is something that you sign up for and that actual moment of signing up is mm. somehow important. And I wondered if um, you'd spotted any uh, uh, developments in that area. Um, at the moment, oh, I don't need a microphone, do I? I've got one. Um, yeah, at the moment, I think um, other institutions are looking at that model too. They're looking at changing, so from as a result of looking at MOOCs and seeing people's reactions and seeing how they're in engaging in technology and education, they're looking at changing the model of education they're providing, which I think is a good thing. So p some institutions are looking at doing pick and mix almost um, modules in their university so that they can take choices. I haven't seen it particularly, um, I know that Coursera um, are encouraging people to do that pick and mix approach so that you can have your own qualification, your own make, make your own degree kind of thing. Um, but they're still asking you to go through the whole course. But um, I think, uh, yeah, I think again, it'd be with the analytics, won't it? It'd be with all the information we get. How do people participate? What's their interest? You know, that's going to be. Overall, can you say that you're seeing institutions starting to consider um, accreditation, uh, you know, more formal accreditation of any kind or taking any steps towards this? Yes. Well, only in terms of future learn. So if you think of future learn, um, they just started to do the, the equivalent of the signature track from Coursera. So you pay for a certificate. So there is that kind of recognition. And in now, of course, LinkedIn, you can add certificates to LinkedIn. So when there's a driver like that, the benefits to the user or the learner are they can demonstrate their completion, then there's got to be money in that. Mm -hmm. You can pay for that. I so. guess I mean a link to the university. Like, is the university giving its blessing at some point that, you, that you're seeing? No, not yet. Yeah. No, not unless they're delivering, unless they were designing their own away from the, a particular platform. So if you had your own course away from a platform, so if you went to Udemy, for example, then you could technically produce a certificate, but then that's when badges would come in to me. Yeah. I would give a badge, not yet, but potentially. <laughs> the badge would be, because that's authenticated by the institution, so that would be your recognition. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to go along later to the... Uh, to, to Yay, come along. To, to Everyone's come. This, to continue this discussion, and you're all very welcome yes. uh, to, to join us. And at this point, can I, can I thank you thank for you. your presentation? Thank you. And there's now a quick break between transitions, so we'll go and grab a